Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. A new hair in the bathroom, could it be cause for surveillance? Today's subboard story. Enjoy the show! I looked into the mirror of our luxurious bathroom with its double vanity, and what I saw made me quite happy. Married for 20 years to a beautiful woman whom I absolutely adored, with a gorgeous daughter of whom I was extremely proud, an income that provided financial security until and after retirement, and a body that was in excellent working order for a long time. At 43 years old, I was in the comfort zone of existence that I knew many men dreamed of. Yeah, I was one of the lucky ones, if you consider the terrible hours spent working to provide our income, and let's not forget the long, difficult, but ultimately rewarding time spent courting the woman of my dreams, and the nightmarish nights of babysitting as our daughter went from a very sick one-year-old to a precocious teenager to a settled woman in college studying to be a doctor. Yeah, luck played its part, but the main contribution to our success was hard work and determination. Rachel, my wife, has never worked since our daughter Megan was born. This was simply unfortunate because Megan was a sickly child and required almost constant attention from both Rachel and me. Rachel was a qualified architect but never realized her dream of working in the field due to her commitment to raising our daughter. I often felt sad for her about this. I met her when we were both in our second year of our courses. She was studying at the Faculty of Design and Architecture, and I was at the Faculty of Engineering. She always talked about designing ideal buildings, it was a passion for her, hence my sadness for her. However, she never even hinted that she felt this loss. Being a determined person, she simply pulled herself together and did what needed to be done. My name is Tom Wildthorpe, and I make our living fixing engineering problems at power plants around the country. It does involve quite a few unexpected journeys and has been so for almost our entire married life. I might have preferred to stay in office jobs, but Rachel and I discussed the fact that additional income would make our financial lives much easier. Fortunately, Rachel adjusted to these expectations from the very beginning of our married life and never once complained about my absence, although I always felt damn guilty when I left at any moment. I was rarely gone for more than two nights, so I made sure she understood my undying love for her and my deep gratitude for her willingness to help while I was away. My golden rule has always been that if I was away for one night, I would arrange a one-night date to make up for it. The formula was the same for two or three nights, two nights away meant two dates, etc. Luckily, my parents and hers were about 20 minutes away from our house, so childcare was easy. I returned to the image in the mirror, I was a very happy person. I shaved like I always do when I come home. Sure, I have a travel shaving kit in my travel bag, but it never quite achieves the closeness and smoothness of a good shave. Rachel likes it when I shave, she knows I'm doing this just for her. Nothing irritates her more than when I come at her with stubble on my chin. My entrance into the kitchen was greeted with big hugs and kisses. They both radiated hope for a busy night ahead. You owe me a party, Rachel cooed, running her fingertips lovingly along my clean-shaven chin. Can I choose the seat this time? Anything for you, baby, I replied, returning her hug and smiling. Our eyes met, and I realized how much I love this woman. I would kill for her, hell, I'd die for her. Our lifestyle sucks sometimes, but we seem to come out on top every time. As expected, we met for our date night and got our needs met later that night. Since our daughter left home, we have enjoyed the freedom to make love anywhere in the house. We made as much noise as we wanted, it was a freedom we loved, especially after the difficult years of early child rearing. Not that they weren't worthwhile, we wouldn't trade the time we spent with our daughter for anything, but it was a fair restriction on our personal life. We both loved our daughter, Megan, she was the completion of our marriage. There is nothing better than seeing how this little defenseless person, completely relying on the love and care of her parents, grows and develops. I was actually really worried about her as she was going through a hormonal teenage phase, but Rachel seemed to have an understanding with her. Sometimes I envied the almost secret bond between mother and daughter, but Megan had always made it clear that I was her special dad. Rachel would glance sideways at her when Megan said this, and in those moments, I could read the silent body language between them. Then Megan would always hug me and say, I love you, dad, and that always melted my heart. This moment, as always, moved on to another topic, but warm memories were deposited in my subconscious. Life continued as before. 
Less than three weeks had passed before I was called back to the north for two days. I hated it, it was usually very cold, and it took forever to get in and out. I often had to wait long and boringly in freezing airports for connecting flights to return home after completing my duties, solving engineering problems, and writing extensive reports. I became angry, the endless wait in the cold staging area only increased my anxiety. Arriving home cold, angry, and tired, I did my usual thing, I kissed and hugged my wife and immediately went to the bathroom to shower. Believe me, a long hot shower does wonders for changing your mood. Feeling normal again, I looked in the mirror to start shaving. That's when I saw it. What? What could I see in my bathroom that could ruin my ideal existence? A little hair. A small black hair got stuck between the faucet on my side of the bathroom sink and the white tile on the backsplash. I notice things, that's why I do my job so well. Over the years, I've developed the habit and ability to notice small details. The ones that are usually overlooked are the ones that cause problems. I'm not OCD about this habit, but I know it helps in my work. I don't have black hair. There's not even any dark pubic hair, this is a legacy of my Dutch heritage. Basically, all my hair is a very light brown color. Could it be Rachel? Nope, she's of Danish descent, and all her hair is a beautiful golden blonde. Could it be Megan? Did she come home while I was gone? Why would she use our bathroom anyway? She always used the master bathroom downstairs. Megan started life with jet black hair, but when she turned one, her hair began to resemble Rachel's. She went through a gothic phase in her early teens. Wow, I remember those years. It was a difficult time for me and Rachel. Megan often treated me with disdain and Rachel with outright rudeness. All my friends simply advised me to wait out the crazy years and hope that she would become human again in the near future. Luckily, she did, almost overnight, she transformed back into a decent person who treated me with the utmost respect and obvious love. However, her relationship with Rachel still seemed distant. During the gothic era, as Rachel and I called it, Megan had jet black hair and all the other goth accessories. Even now, she keeps her hair black. It could have been her hair in my sink, but it was extremely unlikely. Let's return to the problem. My brain was working at full capacity, which it was used to. I do this every day. My job is to quickly get to the bottom of the problem and find solutions. Perhaps it was because of my crappy experience on the last assignment that pushed my mood into a negative paradigm. I looked at a perfectly normal little detail and immediately imagined the worst. It was just a slight deviation from my normal life. Get a hold of yourself, my rational mind screamed. It's not a big problem. But this was very different. This problem was probably related to our marriage. Going from one stray hair to the destruction of a marriage seemed like a quantum leap, but until another explanation was found, here it is. How did this hair get there? It was obvious that it had been trimmed because it was the same thickness all the way through. It did not taper to a thin tip. Could it have been shaved? Maybe cut with scissors? I checked my side of the cabinets under the sink, of course, my entire shaving kit was there. Blades, cream, scissors, etc. were in place. Now I had to wonder if someone else was using my set while I was away. This required investigation. I carefully arranged my kit so that I could easily tell if it had been used. Rachel never used my set as she preferred those women's razors which she thought were smoother and, of course, much more colorful. Part of me wanted to laugh at it all and forget about it. Another, gradually growing part wanted to get to the bottom of this discrepancy before it completely destroyed our happy existence. I must be wrong, I kept telling myself. The next few weeks were a surreal existence for me. I always questioned what I saw, heard, and felt. Paranoia reigned supreme. I found myself checking my shaving kit every day and looking for more hair every chance I got. My set always came back exactly the same way I left it. Every little argument was microanalyzed for any hints. Even when we made love, I was on guard for unusual or false reactions. If Rachel left the house, I analyzed where she went, for how long, and whether she could have been doing anything else. It was definitely not a happy time for me. I thought I hit it well. Being an experienced operator with a poker face at my job, I knew I could do this easily at work. But having to do it all the time at home caused my stress levels to skyrocket. 
Something had to happen. Adding to my troubles was a short one-night call for the middle of the next week. As usual, I performed my return rituals, except for one detail. First, I checked for hair, then I checked my shaving kit. What the heck? I whispered in disbelief. There was no hair, but my kit had clearly been used. It wasn't standing where I had left it. Someone used it while I was away. Now I was really angry. What the hell is going on here? My mind couldn't comprehend the full implications of this discovery. I hoped that what the evidence pointed to was wrong. As usual, I shaved, took a shower, and went downstairs. One of the benefits of routines is that they can be performed without full awareness. I moved as if in a dream. My hearing was tunnel-like, my ears heard, but I didn't listen to anything. Nothing was registered. Rachel noticed my short mood and commented on it. Love, you've worked too hard. I've never seen you so stressed. Is there something I can do? And there was that playful look that always let me know what she was thinking. Usually, this meant a lovemaking session. Normally, this kind of invitation would not go unanswered, especially with such a sparkle in her eyes and a loving touch. But this time, I just blurted out that I needed some time. I'm sick of work, Rachel said. She understood and even suggested that I take a couple of days to relax on my own. She even had a place in mind. It was a small B&B about three hours away by the beach. We had often talked about going there for a weekend together but never found the time. It will do you good, she said. I love you so much and I want you to go and recharge. My mind immediately saw in the offer what my paranoid mind feared. It was a chance for her to continue whatever she had been doing while I was away. I seemed to reluctantly agree that I would go as soon as I could get work done. Well, it happened. Two weeks later, my work group was way ahead of the curve on their projects, and everyone was given three days off. I packed a few things and a collection of books into the car and hit the road. Rachel tried to kill me with kindness before I left, but she was pretty reserved when it came to Intim. Again, my paranoia went into overdrive. As I drove out of our neighborhood, she waved at me from the front yard, and I thought about turning around and confessing what I suspected so she could explain what I saw and put my fears to rest once and for all. But I should have known, my Dutch heritage came into play again. My father always called me Kaskop, Dutch slang for stubborn. Literally translated, it meant cheese head. You may have seen the large round red cheese balls on display for tourists at the Alkmaar cheese markets. If so, you know them as tough, resilient pieces of cheese coated in wax that can take a lot of beating. I needed the facts before I took this any further. If I was wrong, life would go on, and I would have to clear my mind of all the negative and worst-case scenarios that had filled it lately. My trust in Rachel had depleted to the point that I could not continue at this pace. If I was right, then it would be hell. Infidelity was something Rachel and I talked about early in our relationship. We both agreed that it was one and done. I took this commitment very seriously, but I began to hope that Rachel took it the same way. My trip was short. I arranged to leave my car at a workshop no more than four kilometers from home, supposedly for a thorough check and service. I explained to Mr. Pews, the mechanic, that he could take the car away for three days to do a thorough job. He didn't have to contact me about possible faults, as I gave him carte blanche to do what was necessary and I would pick up the car and pay the bill at the end of the three days. I saw his money-oriented brain working behind his eyes. It was a gold mine. He usually had a long line of irritated customers arguing over every item on the bill. He would find any faults, no matter how small, and charge me accordingly. Dollar signs back into him. From there, it was a short walk to the car rental agency, where I rented a small white sedan. It was the most inconspicuous car available. These cars were practically invisible in the stream of other equally uninteresting white cars on the road. I drove this car back to our area. I spent quite a lot of time devising a plan where I could set up surveillance of our home. Quite a lot of pensioners live on our street. As nice as these people are, they often have a lot of free time and spend it doing what might be called curiosity. Nothing gets past their inquisitive eyes. These people were to be avoided at all costs. Luckily, there was a small grove of trees and bushes hiding an empty plot of land that was invisible to most people. That's where I went. 
I decided not to be there all the time. However, I stayed there for short periods. Just being there all the time would look strange and would probably arouse suspicion. Oddly enough, I didn't like feeling like I was peeping on my neighbors. My time on duty was not in vain. Less than two hours into my observation, I saw Rachel's car driving away. I called her immediately. I saw her look at the phone, and the engine was turned off before she answered. Hey, Ratch. Just thought I'd call my lovely wife. How are you? Missing me already? Hello, darling. I was just thinking about you. What's this beloved wife? Do you have another not-so-beloved one? Have you arrived yet? Of course, you have. Already settled in? Please use this time to really relax, my love, so that whatever was driving you crazy will pass. She truly acted like my loving wife, caring about my well-being and feelings. I admit, at that moment, I felt like a real idiot. How could I do what I did and think such thoughts about my wife, my life partner? Thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate this time. What are you doing now? Oh, nothing special. Just sitting and reading while the laundry gets done. You know, the usual boring stuff. I think I'll be at home all day doing housework. I have to go, honey, the laundry is almost done. I'll call you in the evening. Bye, beloved. I love you very much. Um, okay? Bye, Ratch. We'll talk tonight. Why did she lie? If she was driving somewhere, she could have just said so. It wouldn't have mattered to me if she said she was going on some business. It started to smell bad. I quietly followed her. She drove to a local shopping center but didn't get out of the car. She seemed to be waiting for someone. I noticed she was talking on the phone right after parking. Why would she do this? My mind began to spin in narrowing circles again, focusing on the distinct possibility that all in the Wild Thorpe marriage was not as it seemed. I didn't want to believe it, even with the mounting evidence. I searched for a million reasons why this might not be the case. It really was like that. Not even two minutes after parking, a man got into Rachel's car. If it were for the passionate kiss that immediately followed, I would still be able to believe that this date was innocent. It wasn't innocent. This intimate act was familiar to both. This was not a one-time, timid meeting, it was an act performed with the practice and grace of two lovers absolutely confident in their intimacy. That's when I threw up. I couldn't help myself. There were no usual warning signs, no stomach cramps, no stickiness on the skin, no heart palpitations, just right away. Even in my frustration, I thought that now I would have to explain the mess and smell in the rental car. With my eyes full of tears and feeling weak, I noticed that Rachel and her lover had left. I could only guess where. I couldn't chase them in that state. To my great shame, some other customers saw my illness and offered to help. Shakily, I tried to explain that I was fine, but you know, some people are just too kind. I had to give in and accept their help. Wet towels and baby wipes appear out of nowhere. I was wiped, cleaned, and tidied up by many hands. I was amazed by the kindness of some people who quickly got me and my car in order. However, the lingering smell on me and in the car would take time to go away. I thought about going straight to the hotel I had arranged, but I needed to know. I didn't know exactly where they were going, but based on the evidence in my bathroom, I could guess. The drive back to our area seemed like an eternity, with the windows wide open for obvious reasons. I was very worried that someone would recognize me as I parked in the grove of trees, but no one seemed to be outside. My eyes were dry, even though I had shed tears. My mouth was dry and still had a bitter taste from the attack, but I stayed put, just to be 100% sure. They were in the house for about four hours, four hours of hell for me, but no doubt four hours of heaven for them. Afterward, they both quickly left the house. Rachel had parked in the garage as soon as she got home, and now, four hours later, she was leaving again. The man with Rachel positioned himself so that he could not be seen by random passers-by, but I was definitely not one of them. The top of his head, especially his jet black hair, was barely visible above the dashboard. As if on autopilot, I followed them again to the mall, where, after another long kiss, he walked out. Rachel left the idiot, 
then calmly walked over to another parked car and drove away too. My stupor gave way to anger, anger I hadn't felt since elementary school when the school bully decided it was my turn to give him my lunch. He was a huge child, much bigger than me, and walked around as if he could do whatever he wanted. Although I always watched his actions from afar, I still wanted to be bigger and more confident to do something about it. So now it's my turn. Give me your lunch, Tommy Tucker. Ha, I like it. Give me your lunch, Tommy Tucker. With a trembling voice, I replied, No. Take yours. It's mine. He was not used to refusals and froze for several seconds. He towered over me and shouted, Give me your lunch now. The screaming is what made me angry. No one ever screamed in our house. I wasn't used to this level of hostility towards me. Later, when I reflected on this incident, I was always surprised at my lack of fear. It was just anger, red, furious anger. This lunch was mine. My mom bought special chocolate sprinkles from the gourmet store just for my lunch. In Holland, it is a real delicacy to spread them on fresh bread with plenty of butter. I was really looking forward to this lunch. It was better than the regular vomit sandwiches. This time, when I answered, it was in an almost calm voice. Later, recalling this incident, my classmates couldn't believe how calmly and decisively I acted. They said they saw the threat on my face. When John bullied me, I saw it in time and said, No, take yours. He tried to grab my hair, which was quite long at the time. I had seen him do this countless times to other victims, so I knew what he was planning. Everything happened as if in slow motion. When his hand reached out, I quickly stood up, simultaneously extending my left hand, not my dominant hand. I have big hands, another legacy of my Dutch heritage. My left hand clenched into a fist, and as I rose, it connected with John's mouth and nose with the full force of my ascent. The crunch I heard is a sound I will never forget. John's eyes opened wide in shock, and his mouth silently opened and closed rhythmically like a fish's. Then he collapsed, lying on the ground in sounds. I leaned towards him again and, in a calm, quiet voice, said directly into one of his ears, I said no, but if you really need lunch, here it is. I crushed my sandwiches, my delicious sandwiches, the lunch I was looking forward to, and stuffed them into his now bleeding mouth. I think he couldn't have bitten off anything at that point because I noticed a few loose teeth in the front of his mouth. I continued to rub and crush the sandwiches into his mouth until the teacher on duty pulled me away from him. The screams of the surrounding children were so loud that I could hardly hear what the teacher said. Tom, what's gotten into you? Get to the office now. The adrenaline wore off as I was taken back to my punishment. The secretary in the office saw me come in and barely caught me as I collapsed in a crying mess. At that young age, I didn't understand the feeling of real anger. My life had always been calm, surrounded by happy people. I had never felt such anger before, until that moment. I followed the man back to his house. He lived in a fairly well-furnished house close to a shopping center, actually, it was a mansion. The design was something out of Home Beautiful magazine, the perfect roof lines, delicate shades of color, and large, imposing windows behind the wide verandas made this home say one word to anyone who saw it, wealth. Landscaped gardens only enhanced this impression. I noticed his appearance now. He looked about the same age as Rachel and me, with dark black hair and a very trim physique. I would have sworn he was of Mediterranean descent, with his thick black hair and dark complexion. The clothes he was wearing were obviously very expensive, they almost looked custom-made. The way he got out of the car and walked to the front door of his house spoke volumes about the arrogance of this idiot. I've seen these types on construction sites all over the country. They treated everything as if it existed only to satisfy them. They often treated others with contempt. I had no time for such people, but for this one, I had a special hatred. With a growing sense of horror, another detail entered my mind. I saw it, but in my dull state of thought, it didn't fully register. When Rachel first picked him up, he had a day-old Mediterranean stubble of black hair. I always laughed and called it a terrorist look when I saw it on workers I came into contact with. When I saw him again, he was clean-shaven. Idiot, I said out loud. Dirty piece of scum. Now everything became clear. 
I was about to get out of the car and face him when an elegantly dressed woman came out of the front door. They seemed to know each other. How could I understand this? Well, they kissed each other on the cheeks. He quickly retreated into the house, and she began to mess around in the yard. She was soon joined by a mini version of herself, apparently her daughter. The daughter looked vaguely familiar. One more detail to figure out later. They talked and laughed a lot about some untold story. Time to leave. I had learned everything I needed to know. The meeting with this man was supposed to happen later. As angry as I was, I wasn't going to beat him up in front of his wife and little daughter. Not only did my wife cheat on me with this loser, but he also cheated on his own wife and daughter. How vile. How can one person do such things to other people, knowing it will cause pain and suffering, especially when there was no history of hostility? I never understood it, but I had a feeling that I would find out what this experience was like. He will pay. I needed to do something. The time spent away proved to be a blessing in disguise. I could do what needed to be done without making excuses at home. Unfortunately, the same behavioral patterns followed the two cheaters every day while I was away. Now, I didn't have to follow them everywhere, I knew what was happening. The usual list of pre-divorce precautions was followed, credit cards, pension beneficiaries changed, payroll deposits redirected, utility data changed, cell phone plans canceled, you know, all the usual stuff. The plethora of websites and self-help sites have been a huge help, but a sad indictment of the state of marriage in our world. I made an appointment with a divorce lawyer. It was very strange how these lawyers called themselves family lawyers when most of their work resulted in the breakdown of families, go figure. The documents were prepared, but their delivery was delayed until I was ready. I arranged for a private investigator that first day at a significant fee due to the urgency of my request to fully document one day of Rachel's infidelity. I needed documented evidence of the disgusting behavior of these two. I also needed to talk to Megan. She was our daughter, and besides me and her mother, she was the person who should have been most affected by this. Now I regret it. If I thought this situation was already bad and destructive to my marriage to Rachel, destroying our family unit, my self-esteem, and my value as a husband, I was wrong. Hey, Megan, we need to talk. This is about your mom and me, were the first words out of my mouth when I walked into her apartment. This isn't going to be pretty, so we better both sit down. Don't worry, this isn't about you, this is about your mother and me. Dad, you look terrible. What happened? Oh damn, you know, don't you? Sorry, Dad but this isn't just about you and mom, it's about me too. At that moment, she burst into tears and hugged me tightly. She didn't let go, continuing to try to speak. In the end, I just had to return her hug and calm her down until she could control her sobs. Megan, no, this is not about you. This will affect you, that is, us as a family, but it is not your fault. Hush, daughter. What I am about to tell you concerns only me and your mother. I have to tell you what will happen soon so that you are prepared for everything that will happen. You don't need to change anything, except that our family will look a little different in the future. This didn't calm her down at all. If anything, it caused more bouts of sobbing and hugging. When she calmed down again, she moved away from me slightly and looked at me with tear-filled red eyes. Dad, what I'm about to tell you is something I've kept inside since I was a rebellious teenager. Do you remember how I went completely off the rails? I could tell you were really worried about me. I nodded and said, of course, Mags. It was the most stressful time of our lives. Sorry, Dad, there was a reason I became a goth and did all that other stupid stuff. This wasn't just your average teenage angst. What I'm about to tell you is going to hurt you. I know this knowledge hurt me incredibly for years. I think you better sit down. I'll bring us something stronger. I was in a daze. Here I was, about to tell my daughter why I was divorcing her mother, and I was hit with the promise that what I was about to hear would be devastating. I sat and waited silently. The long glass of bourbon was taken unconsciously, as were the first two huge gulps of the scalding liquid. Yes, Dad, we need to talk. We need to talk about me and Mom. First, about Mom. You obviously found out your mom cheated on you years ago. 
I was about to interrupt and clarify what I knew, but Megan shushed me and continued. When I was about 13, you know, hormones, boys, self-esteem, cruel girlfriends, well, one of my friends kept attacking me, saying that my skin color didn't exactly match yours or mom's. It affected me so much that I started obsessing over it, and I linked it to the fact that my mother always insisted that I dye my hair. What? I interrupted her. What does it mean to dye your hair? This conversation was getting weirder and weirder. Mom always dyed my hair. She told me she had been doing this since I was one year old. I saw your childhood photographs. My hair is naturally jet black. I had a feeling that in the pit of my stomach, it was getting deeper and deeper. I felt my face turn pale and my blood pressure drop. No, of course not. Megan saved me from completely collapsing by insisting that I take two more sips of bourbon. The highly caustic liquid calmed me down somewhat. Have a drink, Dad. That's not all. I'm really sorry. Is it true? I need to tell you the truth. You can't imagine how much I've been afraid of this moment since the day I found out. Have a drink, there's plenty more of that in this bottle, Dad. Mom had an affair. She had this with an old university friend after you got married. All I can say, Dad, is this, you are not my biological father. Here she stopped and refilled my glass. Luckily, she immediately hugged me tightly and sobbed into my shoulder. That beautiful hug that I loved so much in our happy times now only resulted in a wet shoulder and a feeling of utter emptiness and hopelessness. I'm not sure who cried more, but at that moment, I knew I could never feel worse than I did now. Our mutual embrace was perhaps the only thing that kept me in the present. Dad, Dad, I think I know how you feel, but I need you to know that I love you more than anything in this world. You are my father. You have always been my father, and you always will be, no matter what my DNA says. Don't you remember that I always called you my special dad? It's because you are, and always have been. Then I continued to irritate my mother with my fears until, finally, one day when you weren't there, she confessed to me about her affair with the idiot. My eyes met hers at that derogatory name for my biological father. Yes, dad, that's how he will always be to me, an idiot. You are my father, not him. I met him once, I think my mother set it up, pretending it was an accident. By that time, I was already part of the gothic scene. I think all this strange behavior was caused by my feelings of insecurity and disgust at what mom did. I even hated you for a while, thinking that you must have somehow allowed mom to stray like that. Eventually, I realized that you didn't know, and I replaced the feelings of anger towards you with feelings of love and sadness. I decided to make our relationship the loving one it should be. I never forgave my mother. So, I looked at the idiot, and he looked at me. I saw that what he saw didn't impress him. I mean, nothing scares a man more than the sight of a black-haired, pale-skinned, skinny teenage girl wearing black leather pants, a jacket, silver bracelets on a chain, and black mascara. I think you understand. Mom tried to get me to dress differently, but you know me, at that age, it wasn't going to happen. The meeting to put it mildly, was not a success. Mom told me in no uncertain terms on the way home what would happen to our family if I ever told you, or even hinted to you, about what I knew. We would be a divided family living below the poverty line. I wouldn't be able to see you because she would take care of it through the courts. My life would be miserable. Sorry, Dad, but my teenage brain couldn't handle that level of responsibility. I decided to do as my mother wanted and not say a word to you. Megan's eyes sparkled again as she continued, but after that, I always called you my special dad. I saw that this title directly touched your heart. Mom hated it and always looked at me funny when I said it. A little rebellion. I found a way to stick it to mom by keeping my promise to her while at the same time giving you some of the love and respect you deserved. Have a drink, dad. You've made a great discovery, and now we need to talk about what's going to happen. Megan. I came here to tell you that I am divorcing your mother. Everything is already in motion. I just didn't want this to come as a shock to you, especially after what you told me. A lot of things make sense now. I had no idea that you were not my biological daughter. Please don't get me wrong, Mags. You will always be my daughter. 
You have carried so much for so long, and how you've dealt with it makes me even prouder of you than before. My heart is breaking now. The feelings of pain, hurt, betrayal, anger, emptiness, and despair are, fortunately, balanced by the love you've shown me as your father. We hugged tightly again and felt the love and togetherness that defined our relationship as father and daughter. But Megan, dear Megan, now you need a drink. I handed her a glass drink. Megan, there's something else I recently found out that your mom didn't stop the affair after you were born. She continued it and continues it now, and I mean right now as we speak right now she's having a night with him in our own home. No, Dad. How could she do this to you, to us? I know she's my mom, but now she's just a cheater. Megan, enough of this. While I completely agree with what you said, she is still your mother and always will be. It's okay for me to call her a cheater because soon she won't be my wife anymore. We both looked at each other, and although this was not my intention at the beginning of this outburst, I began to laugh. Megan soon joined me, and we laughed until we cried. It seems that after the next glass of bourbon, we each became serious again. What's his name, Megan? Your biological father, I mean. Do you know? Yes, Dad, I know. His name is Miguel Rodriguez. His family has always been rich. Apparently, his father started importing expensive cars, and the idiot runs the business for him. Mom and he were a couple at university. I think mom smelled money, but he left her when his family didn't approve of her choice. It seems like they never forgot each other. I know where he lives now. He has a wife and a daughter. I know why the daughter seemed familiar to me. She looks just like you at that age. Sorry, Megan, but you have a half-sister who looks like you, only younger and, as I see, with black hair, not brown like I remember yours at that age. Dad, this day couldn't get any weirder. What are you going to do, or rather, what are we going to do? You're not alone in this, Dad. I know Mom cheated on you, I mean, betrayed you, but she also betrayed me. We can't leave it like this. Megan, let me figure it out. Like I said, everything is already in motion to deal with your mom. I'll have to reconsider what to do with him, I mean, the idiot. Upon returning home at the expected end of my time to recharge, Rachel welcomed me with open arms. She tried to give me a big hug and kiss, which I rudely refused. To say she was stunned would be an understatement. She physically pulled away from me and asked, Beloved, what happened? Did something happen? I didn't want to reveal what I knew until I was ready, so I suppressed my anger and, using my best poker face, replied, Just something at work, Ratch. I thought time away would be good for me, but now I've learned that new problems have arisen while I was away. After I said that, I realized how it might sound, so I quickly added, I mean, during my absence. There will be a lot of things I need to take care of, and that might mean more time away. Sorry. Rachel looked at me with confusion, obviously, she didn't know how to take what I had just said. In the end, she must have decided on an innocent interpretation, probably because she and Miguel had been cheating for so long without arousing suspicion. Why would it be different today, right? The next few days were crazy. I tried to act as normally as possible, but when you feel physically sick at any hint of intimate contact, it's hard to hide that something is wrong. Rachel seemed to accept my explanation of work problems as the reason for my strange behavior. I needed to leave again. Being around Rachel drove me crazy with anger. Two days later, I made the call to leave again, pretending it would be a longer absence. Rachel accepted it as one of my usual absences and didn't wait long to call Miguel, the idiot. Miguel, as usual, was not expecting this. This time, everything was different. As soon as he arrived at our house in Rachel's car, I called 911 on the phone I bought at the local 7-Eleven. Hi, this is John Rodriguez. I think my brother Miguel has been kidnapped and is being held at 25M Parade. Please hurry. There is a woman in the house with him, and I think she is armed. Please hurry. I hung up before the operator started asking identifying questions. Waiting near my usual grove of trees was great, less than five minutes passed before I heard sirens. I couldn't have asked for a better response, a police car, an ambulance, a rapid response team, and best of all, a news truck with live coverage arrived noisily and stopped in front of our house. 
These guys, I later learned, were conducting similar exercises in a quieter area when the call came, just a coincidence. Armed soldiers scattered around the house, climbing over the back fence. The film crew captured this action live and in full color. Everything was going better than expected. The sirens calmed down and were replaced by a loudspeaker announcing the presence of the police. The speaker asked everyone in the house to leave within 20 seconds. Miguel Rodriguez's name was repeated many times, and it was requested that if he was in the house, he should make himself known and leave through the front door. No one came out of the front door, so the decision was quickly made for the SWAT team to enter. Stun grenades were heard, followed by smoke grenades. These guys knew their stuff. Two seconds later, two half without anything people were dragged out the front door and roughly placed face down on the front lawn. They were handcuffed and brought to their feet. The television crew enjoyed this sensation. One of the police officers took pity on Rachel and offered her a coat. Rachel happily accepted it and tried to cover herself. Despite the handcuffs, the coat hit her private parts, but it was clear she was completely without clothes underneath. No one was worried about the idiot. It took time for the police to establish the facts and reluctantly release the two, but the damage was done. After all, the rescuers returned to base, and the entire area was a buzz. Gossip was at its height, and I needed to disappear to avoid being recognized. The fun was over, now all that was left was to wait. Mrs. Amanda Rodriguez received an anonymous call to inform her that there would be an interesting report on the evening news. The news was really interesting. Obviously, no parts without anything were shown, but it was very clear that the couple was without clothes. The couple were identified as Mrs. Rachel Wild Thorpe and Mr. Miguel Rodriguez. They were not husband and wife, but were found without clothes in Wild Thorpe's residence. The couple had no comment other than to say they would sue the authorities for wrongful arrest. Hey, Ratch, I asked my her that evening. It took all my self-control not to laugh as I spoke. How was your day? Oh, um, hi Tom. Everything was fine. Did you see the news tonight? No, not yet. I have a lot of reports. I'll probably watch the late news before I go to bed. I wanted to prolong her concern by adding, this isn't the same as our local news. Why? Is there something happening that I need to know about? Um, no, not really. But we'll need to talk when you get back. That sounds threatening. Okay, I'll see you in a couple of days. Bye. I hung up. This should have raised alarm bells in Rachel. I never hung up on her. I don't know what happened at Rodriguez's house that night but it appears that the idiot was not currently living there. Apparently, he had settled into a job at his father's car dealership and had a fully equipped apartment that he now considered home. I knew right away when Miguel and Rachel met again. This time, they decided that our house was not suitable, and besides, the neighbors were very keen to know what was going on in the Wild Thorpe house. The hotel they chose was managed by Tom, who was an honest, hard-working man. He hated that his hotel was often used for such purposes and could immediately recognize a couple that was up to no good. The couple who rented the room that night looked suspicious, and this suspicion was confirmed when shortly after the couple went up to their room, a well-dressed man entered Tom's office. He politely asked what number the last clients had rented and placed a rather large amount of money on the counter, asking for a spare key for this room. This worried Tom, he was an honest man, and he knew bribes always come back to haunt people. The well-dressed man, who then introduced himself as Roger, explained the reason for his request, and now it was a different matter. Tom agreed, and the money went into the cash register. The two lovers were extremely surprised when their room suddenly seemed crowded. A man in a suit holding two manila envelopes and another man, a hotel manager with a video camera, appeared in the room. The camera was a nice touch, I offered the latter an additional fee if he could capture everything on film. The man in the suit asked, Rachel, are you Mrs. Rachel Wildthorpe? All Rachel could do was nod yes while trying to cover herself. You have been handed the documents, he said very coldly and clinically as he handed her one of the envelopes. Before Rachel could even cry, he turned to Miguel. Are you Mr. Miguel Rodriguez? Yes, it's me. What do you need? You, sir, have also been presented with documents, he said, handing Miguel an envelope. 
The two additional men left the room to the sound of shouting, arguing, sobs, and loud screams. As you can imagine, soon after this, my cell phone became red hot, ringing with call after call interspersed with the characteristic sounds of incoming messages. I ignored them all, not in the mood for any communication with my cheating wife and soon-to-be ex. I called Megan and told her what happened. She wished me luck and assured me again that she loved me and would always be there for me. She also said she would turn off her cell phone and that if I needed to talk to her, I could call her best friend Amanda. After I wrote down the new number, I hung up. Rachel wouldn't be able to contact Megan or me now. I called a local real estate agent and explained that I needed a six-month short-term rental in an area close to my work. The agent, Miss Jones, pointed me to several options along with their online brochures. Half an hour later, I called her back and told her I had chosen one of them, a tidy studio apartment, fully furnished, on the second floor in a gated community just a 10-minute walk from my office. Perfect. I especially liked that it was a gated community, there would be no unexpected visits at strange times. All I needed now were all my things. I really didn't want to meet Rachel at this point, so I came up with a plan to keep her out of the house. I only needed two hours. I hitched the trailer to my car and got my three colleagues ready. My burner phone was very useful. Rachel was in a terrible state. First, there was the SWAT home invasion and that very embarrassing semi-arrest. She was sure that the whole neighborhood saw her and all her without anything. Her years of infidelity were now completely exposed to the world. It's strange, but she hoped Tom wouldn't see it. The arrest incident was not enough to separate her and Miguel for long. They clung to their need to be together even after the shameful revelation. Their need brought them back to the hotel again, and then there was the presentation of documents at the hotel. Life couldn't be more confusing. Over the past few days, she shook her head and wondered how she got into all of this. She had no doubt that her situation was entirely her own fault. Apart from frequent absences, her husband was the best. He adored her, worked hard to provide a comfortable lifestyle, and loved her. She knew it in her heart. So why did she continue her affair with Miguel? That didn't mean he was better in bed than Tom. He didn't have time for romance like he did when they first met. Now, it was mainly because of his wife and daughter, this trophy wife who was so acceptable to the great Rodriguez family. Old Rodriguez hated Rachel from the very beginning, and his wife, Maria, always looked at her as if she were somehow unworthy just because she was dating their precious son. Rachel's family didn't live in an upscale part of town, but they were good, decent people, hard workers, the salt of the earth. Obviously, this was not enough for the Rodriguez clan. Their constant comments and reproaches gradually brought Miguel to the point where he did not even want to talk to Rachel. He loved Intim and loved being with her, but every time they met, Rachel noticed him looking over his shoulder and feeling guilty. Ultimately, he ended their relationship. This broke Rachel's heart. She gave him heart, but even though she knew he loved her too, his family had more influence over him than she did. She hated that family with all her passion. She heard that Miguel moved from girl to girl over the next two years, never settling down with anyone. Perhaps none of them were good enough for the Rodriguez family either, she thought with a certain amount of irony. Exactly how the next stage of their relationship began was unclear to Rachel. She saw him on campus while she was already quite seriously involved with Tom and knew that he should become her husband. But Miguel attracted her. It wasn't just a night, perhaps, to some extent, this was revenge on the Rodriguez family for their mistreatment of her. She often thought about this idea but realized that the relationship between her and Miguel was not so superficial. It was something more. She just couldn't let go of her first love, even though Tom was there. Rachel and Miguel often met secretly at the university. Rachel initially felt guilty for cheating on Tom, knowing it was cheating as she and Tom had discussed an exclusive relationship many times. Everything was so easy, Tom was stressed trying to find time to study. He made time to be with her when he could, but she still had a lot of time to spend with Miguel. Cheating became easier and easier until it became a habit, a habit that was hard to stop even after she and Tom got married. She was always careful with Miguel, ensuring that all meetings took place when Tom was overworked or on one of his many business trips. Everything was going well for Rachel until she found out she was pregnant. 
she never used protections with Miguel, foolishly relying on the rhythm method to avoid pregnancy. For nine months, Rachel couldn't be sure who the baby's father would be. She prayed to all the gods who would listen that the child would be Tom's, but part of her was secretly interested in the idea that it could be Miguel's child. Constant worries and questions about the baby's paternity weighed heavily on Rachel. She later wondered whether this uncertainty had affected Megan's fragile health. As soon as she held little Megan in her arms, she knew it was Miguel's child. She knew this without a doubt, the color of the hair, the eyes, it all spoke of infidelity. But Tom, her dear husband, was absorbed only in the glory of the moment. His beautiful wife, now the mother of his child, was all that filled his feelings. He didn't have the slightest idea. Rachel cried with joy like most new mothers, but her tears were also mixed with guilt, guilt because she knew what she had to do. She needed to ensure that Megan seemed like her and Tom's daughter. She was determined to follow this course as long as possible. Of course, she told Miguel, but she also insisted that Megan be raised as her and Tom's daughter. She and Miguel continued their meetings, but with one exception, now he had to use protections. This must not happen again. When Megan turned one, Rachel deepened the deception by dyeing Megan's hair a color similar to Tom's. Many people at her birthday party commented on her beautiful light brown hair, just like Tom's. Life continued with infidelity, and then Miguel got married. At first, Rachel was furious, but over time she rashly realized that she could not stop Miguel from finding a wife. She had no rights to them other than the fact that Megan was now approaching adolescence. Miguel's wife, Amanda, was great. She came from a wealthy local family associated with a real estate development company. Rachel was sure that their relationship would end now that Miguel had a beautiful wife. Of course, he wouldn't cheat on Amanda. Her mind did not register the hypocrisy that she was willing to cheat on Tom but also believed that the same standard should not be applied to Miguel. She was surprised and secretly pleased that Miguel had made it clear that their secret relationship would continue. Back to the present, and that damn live broadcast of the SWAT team outside their house. Rachel might have been worried about Tom seeing the report, but she overlooked old Rodriguez. Josep Rodriguez was an avid news channel watcher, and when he saw the report on TV, he immediately knew what was happening. That stupid, stupid son, he shouted at the huge screen in front of him. Why does he always think in one place? Part of him understood the need for a man, especially a Rodriguez man, to sleep with as many women as possible, but he had curbed his desires when he married Maria. She wasn't his first choice either, his parents and her parents arranged their marriage without his participation. But over time, he began to respect, although not particularly like, this woman. This woman, Maria, who came from a good family and adapted to the role of a devoted wife and mother, a role for which she was prepared from birth. This woman endured 24 hours of difficult labor to give birth to Miguel and then learned from the doctor that the difficult labor had robbed her of the opportunity to have more children. This woman, who almost by will wished her son to grow up quickly and give her grandchildren, watched with alarm as her son moved from one meaningless romance to another and finally tried to settle on a Danish girl who did not meet the requirements of the Rodriguez clan. This woman, who waited patiently and worried as cancer spread silently and insidiously through her body until she died without holding her grandson in her arms, yes, Josep thought, Maria would turn over in her grave if she saw what her spoiled son was doing. The Rodriguez clan would not be happy. We'll have to atone for our guilt, honor demands it. Unfortunately, Josep realized that this could end badly for Miguel. The fact that he was caught in a cheap hotel with a married woman only added to the stain on the Rodriguez name. For some reason, the Baith felt it necessary to inform him of this fact shortly after serving the documents on Rachel and Miguel. This was not normal procedure, so someone must have paid the performer extra money for this. The clan needs to gather as soon as possible. Tom used his burner phone and his best disguised voice to call Rachel and tell her that there was another news crew outside her house and that it would be wise to spend the night somewhere else if she wanted any peace. Rachel took the advice and took a taxi to another hotel. Perhaps everything would look better after some sleep. She still kept trying to contact Tom, but all the calls went to voicemail until the number stopped answering altogether. Megan's phone was the same. Without Miguel, without Tom, and without Megan, Rachel felt strangely alone for the first time in her life. 
Meanwhile, when it became clear that Rachel would not be coming home, my team and I got to work. First, all my belongings were loaded into the car and trailer, some had to be put into assistant cars. All of Rachel's belongings were then roughly packed into boxes and stored in the garage. Megan's things went with me. All furniture was disassembled and placed in the garage. Luckily, it was a double garage. The last item on the agenda was to change all the locks, except the automatic garage door. The internal door from the garage to the house was double locked from the inside. Rachel now had access to her things and all the furniture if she so chose, but the house, our old home, was out of reach and completely empty. Of course, I left the original garage remote in its usual hiding place in case Rachel didn't bring her set of keys with her. See, I wasn't a complete idiot. It was a hell of a job, and I definitely owe my team a big thank you. Miguel received a summons from his father shortly after the documents were served. Miguel knew that serving the documents was not an excuse for him to disobey his father's subpoena, but what could be so important? He knew that when his father made a challenge like that, there was no doubt it had to be done, and quickly. Miguel was very nervous as he drove to the family estate outside the city. If he was nervous during the ride, he almost passed out when he pulled up to the roundabout. There, in hierarchical order, were parked all the cars he knew well from childhood. Damn it, there's a clan meeting going on, he thought aloud as he parked his car next to the others. Apparently, he was at the lowest level of the hierarchy since his car was the last one. All his uncles and remaining close relatives would be there. It was obvious that an important decision would be made that would likely affect the entire clan. Since he did not know the topic of the upcoming discussion, Miguel, in addition to being nervous, was very excited. He had never been allowed to attend such meetings when he was younger, and such meetings had been rare since then. He almost ran into the great hall of his family home. There they were, all sitting around a huge oak table. At the head of the table was his father, J. Rodriguez. Despite the tense relationship with his father over the years, mainly due to his poor choices of women, he could not help but feel proud of his father, the head of the Rodriguez clan. It was a position Miguel hoped to hold one day. As he approached the table, the general noise ceased and all eyes turned to him. Miguel smiled at the relatives he knew, but it didn't seem appropriate to talk to any of them. The responses were either stern or neutral, like those of poker players. An uncomfortable knot began to form in Miguel's stomach as he sat down in the only empty seat at the table. It was the farthest from his father, at the other end of the table. Gradually, Miguel realized that this meeting could concern him. Son, I'm glad you could come, his father said, as if I had a choice, Miguel thought sarcastically. You know most of the men at this table, but let me introduce some you may not know. They each nodded as they were introduced while Miguel smiled nervously. Joseph continued. We are here to discuss some events that will likely cause our family great embarrassment and loss of honor in our community. This family has always been highly respected by those in government, those in power, and the successful businesses we may have helped create. We cannot allow this to change, much less disappear, because of the foolish actions of one of our own. Miguel, in case you forgot, during this meeting, everyone will get one chance to speak. A vote is then taken to determine the fate of the accused. The decision is final. At these words, each member of the clan nodded grimly. You are the accused, son. You will have one chance to present your version of recent events, and then you must remain silent until everyone else has spoken. Do you understand? said Josep with obvious rage. Yes, Dad, I understand. Every eye was on him as he stood up trembling. How much should I tell them? Miguel thought. He decided to be as brief as possible, stating the basic facts. It all started when I was at university, like all of you, he began, looking intently at each of them. I have had many girlfriends. They love my looks, and I seem to win them over easily. One day, a Danish beauty appeared. She had fair skin, blonde hair, and the most piercing blue eyes. I fell in love with her. I even brought her home to get your blessing, Dad. You and mom turned her down. She wasn't good enough for our family. I was told to leave her and find someone more suitable. I tried, but I couldn't. I was addicted to her. She was devastated, and so was I. We both went our separate ways. 
she fell in love with her current husband, Tom, and I continued to look for a family-friendly girl. I couldn't find one, but Rachel and I continued dating even when she was engaged to Tom. There was a murmur across the table. There were no loud exclamations, but Miguel heard unmistakable whispers, traitor, harlot. Miguel continued, we continued our affair after their wedding until I found out she was pregnant with our daughter, Megan. I wanted to ask her to leave Tom and marry me, but I knew it was impossible because everyone in my family hated her. I saw Megan once when she was a teenager. She realized who I was and rejected me without hesitation. I continued to date Rachel but also found a woman who was considered suitable for everyone. Amanda was beautiful, had the right family background, and was ready to marry me. We got married, and now we have a beautiful daughter, Maria. Everything was going well until one day while I was at Rachel's house, the damn police mistakenly broke into Rachel's house, leading to that news report. We are now filing a lawsuit against the authorities. Shortly after, we met Rachel at a hotel that we thought was safe, but by then Rachel's husband Tom already knew about us and handed her the documents at the hotel. You know the rest. Miguel hung his head in a gesture of remorse, hoping to earn some pity points. He sat down and waited. There was an uncomfortable pause as one by one, the assembled men expressed their disgust at Miguel for being so openly adulterous and not caring about the consequences of his desires. His father was the last to speak. Miguel, you are my son, my only son. What you did showed complete disregard for two marriages, a husband, a wife, and two daughters. That may be excusable, but the dishonor and disgrace you have brought upon the name Rodriguez is not. How can we all at this table hold our heads high when everyone knows that one of us has committed such acts? You disobeyed a direct order from me and your mother, peace be upon her, not to have a relationship with this woman. His voice began to rise, and there were loud murmurs of approval around the table. You cannot be forgiven for this. Wait outside while we decide your fate. Miguel almost crawled out of the large hall and closed the doors. They were heavy oak doors, but he could still hear the flashes of anger through them. Miguel didn't like his chances. He knew that the punishments handed out by this group were severe and would be aimed squarely at him and possibly Rachel. He needed to run and hope for the best. As soon as his car left the estate, the clan made its decision. They called him, but the answer was silence. He was to be exiled to a third world country to fend for himself until the clan showed mercy and allowed him to return. His escape, before accepting his fate as a man, further fueled the anger and mistrust of the assembled group. Now they openly demanded blood. Josep could not calm this new call for his death, the death of his only son. The weight of the world fell squarely on his shoulders. He would not only lose his only son but also the right to pass on the leadership of the clan to his family. It would now go to one of his other relatives. He would soon be seated at another place at the table while someone else led the clan. He would be left alone, completely alone, without a wife, without a son, and without prestige. The panel had clear processes for reaching such a verdict. It was not in J.P.'s hands. Miguel was a dead man walking. Later that night, Tom received a strange phone call. It was clearly anonymous and from a number he didn't recognize. The heavily accented caller said, Mr. Tom Wilde Thorpe, we know what recently happened to your marriage. We have decided to give you justice for these serious misfortunes that have befallen you and your daughter. Our advice to you is to immediately leave the country for at least two weeks. Make sure you are seen in public at all times. It is very important you understand this. A certain amount of money has been placed in your apartment's mailbox. This should be enough for your trip abroad and related expenses. There is also a ticket in your name. The flight departs at 6 o'clock in the morning. Please follow this advice. The phone went dead. Tom knew from the caller's tone that he was serious. The package was indeed in his mailbox. It looked like he was flying to Brisbane, Australia, and had two weeks of luxury booked at the number one resort hotel on the Gold Coast. Packing was completed, and he was boarding a Cairns flight the next morning. He told Megan about his journey. She was very curious but decided that her father needed some rest after the emotionally difficult period he was going through. Tom thought about the reasons for this warning and could not sleep during the long transoceanic flight. Sometimes he looked around to relieve his boredom and thoughts, 
and noticed a woman and her daughter sitting a few seats away from him. The fleeting glance stuck in his memory for many hours until he finally realized it was the daughter who helped put the puzzle together. She looked remarkably like Megan, the younger version of Megan. He realized who they were, Amanda Rodriguez and her daughter. He remembered her from his spying on that man's house, which seemed so long ago. She didn't recognize him, so he wondered if he should introduce himself. In the end, he decided to wait until they got off the plane at Brisbane Airport. That's exactly what he did. The baggage carousel was crowded enough that if there was a scene, he could easily get lost among the waiting passengers. Mrs. Rodriguez, you don't know me, but I know you, were his first words to her. To say she was stunned was an understatement. She turned pale and looked around frantically, searching for guards or an escape route. Finally realizing that the only thing possible due to her young daughter and lack of baggage was to face this threat, she looked at the man defiantly and asked, Who are you, and how do you know my name? My name is Tom Wilde Thorpe. Amanda, your husband Miguel and my wife, soon to be ex-wife Rachel, have been having a long-term affair since we both entered into marriage with them. Tom's decision to be brutally honest with Amanda had a disturbing effect on her. She almost lost consciousness, if Tom hadn't been close enough to support her, she would likely have collapsed onto the cold terminal floor. We should probably go and sit over there, Tom suggested, pointing to the nearest cafe in the terminal. We can pick up the luggage in a minute. After they settled into the cafe, Amanda, with her daughter holding tightly to her, began comparing notes about the last 24 hours. It turned out that Amanda also received a call similar to Tom's and, like him, decided to take it seriously. After receiving his luggage and ordering coffee, Tom explained in detail what had happened. Amanda was stunned and silent almost the entire time, except for occasional exclamations of how dare he, and this lying, cheating scoundrel. Tears flowed freely, and Amanda's daughter, whose name was Maria, sat shocked by her mother's language and the strangeness of the situation in which she found herself. They ended up taking a taxi from Brisbane to the Gold Coast, and yes, they were booked into the same resort hotel. It was a long and restless night for everyone. Rachel finally decided to return home to explain herself to Tom. How would she explain everything to the man she had called husband for so many years? Her mind was still preparing her speech for him when she arrived home. Surprisingly, her keys didn't work, but the garage remote did. The sight that met her eyes when the door was raised to its maximum shattered Rachel to the core. All the furniture was packed and disassembled into components, and the boxes, all signed with her name, were stacked in piles. There was a note pinned to the box closest to the garage door. With shaking hands, Rachel carefully took the note. Rachel, at this point, you should have been handed the documents, you lying traitor. Don't try to contact me, because by the time you read this, I will be abroad. If you need to tell me anything, please contact my lawyer. Her name is Marion Smithson. I rented and paid for a studio apartment for the next six months. It is located at 4322 Street, Apartment 5. The keys are on the first box. How you get there with all your belongings is up to you. Whether you decide to stay in this apartment or not is also up to you, but after six months, you are on your own. Hopefully, by this time, if you have signed the divorce papers, we will be almost divorced, and this farce that was our marriage will be history. Megan already knows what you and that lowlife Miguel did. I told her about your recent adulterous activities. She didn't know that you and he continued dating after he became Megan's father. You may have to seriously improve your relationship with her. I don't want anything to do with this. You made your bed, now sleep in it. I hope to never see or speak to you again. If only Tom had realized the prophetic nature of that last statement. He wrote it with anger and venom, but even with all the hatred that Tom felt for Rachel at that moment, he would have been horrified if he had known what awaited Rachel in the future. Rachel fell to the cold garage floor, surrounded by what was left of her marriage and life with Tom. All that was left were boxes of meaningless things and feelings of loss and despair. Gradually, she realized what she had done. There was no way back from this mess. The move to the new apartment went smoothly, as everything was already packed and ready to move. Unpacking and arranging her things only increased her feelings of despair and hopelessness. It was a cold, harsh life she now had to live. Somehow, she managed to furnish the apartment, 
giving it the appearance of a home, but she was constantly aware that it was an empty, cold house. What should she do now? The apartment was paid for six months, but she did not have a job. This should have been her priority. She didn't know where to start. Feelings of hopelessness, loneliness, and despair threatened to overwhelm her. From somewhere deep within her soul, she dredged up her determination. She wasn't going to give up, and the awareness of her natural strength sustained her through the many dark days ahead. Application after application was submitted, but no one she approached was willing to hire someone her age with no experience in building design. Rachel began to regret not having started looking for work earlier, when she was younger. Just when she was about to give up hope, she received a call from Miss San Diego from Mexico Designs and Construction. Mrs. Wild Thorpe, we see that you are looking for a job in the field of building design. Yes, it is, Rachel replied. Well, maybe we have an opening for you. This will only be for six months and will require travel abroad. Are you interested? Absolutely, Rachel replied, trying not to sound too enthusiastic. There might be a little problem. Although I have no family commitments at this time, my apartment lease will expire while I am working. It's no problem, Mrs. Wild Thorpe. Can I call you Rachel? Yes, sure. You see, one of the advantages of this kind of work is that we will take responsibility for your apartment during your absence abroad. When you return, you can simply resume paying rent and other expenses. We will even notify your landlord of the reason for your absence in case of unforeseen circumstances. Your utilities, insurance, and other expenses will also be covered. How does that sound to you, Rachel? That sounds fantastic. When do you expect me to start? Well, as soon as possible. Actually, we have an interview process and we'll need to check your qualifications more thoroughly. How about tomorrow for an interview? If everyone is happy with what they see, we'll start next week with a flight on Sunday, if that's okay with you. I'll see you in our office tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning. Miss San Diego, call me Juanita, then told Rachel the address and what was expected in terms of dress code for the interview. Rachel couldn't believe her luck. Her enthusiasm overshadowed some of the strange interview requests. The request to her tight clothing just didn't appeal to her instincts. Perhaps it was because she had been out of work for too long and was completely unaware of what was now considered the norm. She spent a long time deciding what to wear for this interview. Her bedroom was littered with discarded and then reselect clothes. Finally, she settled on a form-fitting suit that emphasized her advantages. It made the size of her breasts obvious without being too revealing. She finished off the look with professional mid-heel shoes, and she looked impressive. Her hair and makeup also complemented the image of a professional businesswoman. Rachel waited nervously in the small office. The secretary typed non-stop, and the constant harsh sounds only added to her anxiety. Finally, a young woman came out of the office door and introduced herself as Miss Constance San Diego. Come on in, Rachel. God, you are just a sight for sore eyes. I will be conducting the interview with Marcel Venezuela and Diego Consort. They are directors of a construction company. She then directed Rachel towards the center of the office, where two men sat at a large mahogany table. There was something strange about them, but Rachel brushed the feeling aside, chalking it up to her nervous state. Let me take your jacket before you sit down, Rachel Constant asked kindly. Rachel obeyed but was extremely aware that she was now only wearing a shirt. So, Rachel, you want to work for us on a six-month contract? I can say that the money will be more than what you would earn here, especially with your lack of experience. However, your experience in other areas will likely be helpful. At this remark, Rachel looked at the speaker suspiciously, but Constance quickly looked away and continued, What he means, Rachel, is that as a mother, your organizational skills should be well developed. Rachel looked straight at Constance and replied, Yes, of course. Being a mom really prepares you for a lot of logistical challenges. Rachel didn't notice at first that the two men were more interested in her appearance than anything else. Although they occasionally glanced at the rest of her slender body, it was the sidelong glances at each other followed by dirty grins that made Rachel realize the true nature of these men. Constance seemed to distract her attention with persistent questions. At the end of the interview, the two men nodded to Constance and abruptly left the office. 
Well, said Constance, everything went well. Both directors were pleased with what they saw and heard. I can say with confidence that you got the position. On Sunday, you will fly to Mexico City. A limousine will meet you at the airport and take you to the construction site office. Unfortunately, it's quite a long trip, but I heard that the limousine has all kinds of drinks. What a score! A company representative will take care of your apartment issues. Welcome aboard, Rachel. Thank you for coming today. I probably won't see you again since I'm only hired for these types of contracts. Goodbye and good luck. She walked Rachel to the door. Rachel was a whirlwind of emotions. Everything happened so quickly. Her doubts about the true intentions of the two directors quickly disappeared behind a feeling of delight. She had made it, now she had a future that did not depend on either Tom or Miguel. Rachel walked through the airport heading back to her apartment. What Rachel didn't see was that as soon as she left the office, elated to have landed her first job that promised great rewards, Constance and the secretary quickly began dismantling everything that made the room look like a legitimate office. By the time Rachel returned to her apartment, the rooms in which she was interviewed were completely empty and cleared of all traces. The flight went smoothly, and as promised, the limousine met her at the Mexico City airport. The driver took her two suitcases and, as Rachel noted, roughly threw them into the trunk. He did, however, show Rachel how to use the drinks cooler inside the car. Megan and Tom never heard from Rachel again. They were notified by the landlord about Rachel's new job and took it as her way of disappearing. The divorce was uncontested. Meanwhile, Miguel wasn't feeling particularly well either. His brief escape from his relatives ended in a hotel in a small Midwestern town. The midnight call to his room was quick and silent, a well-rehearsed room cleaning that left the hotel room without any trace of Miguel's presence. The cash payment for the room also left no trace of his short stay. Jusup received a phone call before dinner. He listened gloomily and muttered, Gras, another sad chapter in his life was over, but he thought gloomily, it won't happen again. Tom spent a lot of time with Amanda on the Gold Coast. It seemed like this place was made for romance. Even though their feelings of mutual attraction were weakened by recent events in their lives, Tom and Amanda developed a strong friendship in those two short weeks. They never left each other. There was no intim that would come later, much later, and the wedding rings would come in time. In this tragedy, two wounded people found some semblance of peace, normalcy, and more than a little love. The police knew they had no hope of linking their ex-spouse disappearance to Tom or Amanda, their alibis were simply too strong. Two more unsolved cases to add to the growing pile, and who really cared? Tom knew that he was facing the last action in this tragedy. It was something he didn't want to do, but his current wife Amanda encouraged him to do it as a final cleansing act. The door to the mansion opened to reveal a well-dressed servant. Please follow me, Mr. Doe's Wild Thorpe, said the servant. Tom was led into a large hall with a huge oak table in the center. An old man sat at one end. He looked like an older version of the same idiot who seduced Rachel. How can I help you, Mr. Wild Thorpe? asked the old man. Mr. Rodriguez, I wish the circumstances under which we met were different, but such is life, Tom said. Yes, Tom. Can I call you Tom? Call me Jusup. Unfortunately, we are intimately connected by this sad tragedy, so I think formalities are unnecessary. How can I help you? Jusup, I know that you are aware that your ex-sister-in-law Amanda and I got married. Now she is not Rodriguez but Wild Thorpe. I also know that this must be terrible for you. He was your only son, and now he seems to have disappeared along with Rachel. Believe me, I tried to find them, but to no avail. I can only assume that they disappeared because of the shame they must feel for their actions. I went through stages of anger and betrayal. My love for Amanda, her daughter Maria, and my daughter Megan destroyed the hatred I felt. For that, I am very grateful. Jusup was overcome with a deep sadness and physically sagged in his seat. Yes, Tom, they have now received their well-deserved rewards. He glanced at me, expecting me to ask for an explanation, but my inner voice told me to leave it at that. It was better not to know, he said. Jusup, I know you feel a sense of loss. I have come to offer you some comfort during this time of sadness. You know that Megan, my daughter, is actually the daughter of your son and my ex-wife. 
She is your granddaughter as well as my daughter. Maria, Amanda's daughter, is also your granddaughter. You have two beautiful granddaughters. I invite you to remain a part of their lives. They need to stay connected to their family roots. You are the only part of their story left, Rodriguez. They need you. Tears streamed down Joseph's cheeks. He needed time to collect his thoughts and control his emotions. You have no idea what this means to me, Tom. I would be very happy to be a more active grandfather to my granddaughters. This huge house is cold and empty. It needs the joy, laughter, and warmth of children running through its corridors. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Tom. He stood up and walked towards me. I wasn't expecting a hug, but it didn't seem strange. Some kind of integrity and depth of feelings between us was conveyed, which could only be appreciated by two people who have gone through hell and survived. He whispered in my ear, You will always be a welcome guest at this family table, Tom. When he released the hug, he composed himself and said, We have a clan meeting this Sunday. I would be honored if you, Amanda, and the girls would come so I could introduce them to the family. I have a feeling that the clan members will be very happy to welcome new members. What do you think of our story today? It seems to me that the husband did the right thing after he saw Harry didn't recognize. He started to follow his wife to find out the truth and that seems to me to be the right decision. What do you think? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.